Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the GRIPS Forum. My name is Narushige Michita. I teach International Security Affairs at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies, or GRIPS, based in Tokyo. I'll be serving as your host today. When the Asian Development Bank, or ADB, was established in 1966, Asia was one of the poorest regions in the world. Today, it produces a third of the world's economic output and is expected to generate more than a half of the world's economic output by 2050. Despite that success, the Asian Development Bank published a report in January this year entitled Asia's Journey to Prosperity and argued that there was no such thing as an Asian consensus. So we wonder, what were the reasons for Asia's post-war economic success? Why is there no Asia consensus despite that success? Today, we have invited Mr. Takehiko Nakao to answer those questions. Mr. Nakao is currently the chairman of the Mizuho Research Institute and the visiting professor at GRIPS and the to University of Tokyo's Graduate St School of Public Policy. He served as the president of the Asian Development Bank from April 2013 to January 2020. Mr. Nakao has recently published his memoir entitled, How Has Asian Economy Changed? in Japanese. I will ask Mr. Nakao to speak for about 50 minutes and we will open the screen for Q&A and discussion after that. The presentation and discussion in this session will be on the record. Ladies and gen gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Nakao. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Michishita, and I'm very uh, delighted and honored to speak uh, to such a big uh, audience. Uh, and uh, today's uh, theme is: uh, uh, there is a uh, is there a unique Asian consensus for development? And this is uh, based on the uh, Asian uh, Development History Book, uh, named. Uh, Asia's journey to prosperity, as uh, was already introduced by uh, Professor Michishita. And uh, there are so many issues to discuss, and, uh, but one of our main themes is uh, whether the Asian development uh, is uh, unique uh, and uh, uh, whether there is a, such a thing like uh, Asian uh, consensus for development uh, uh, as compared to Washington consensus. And uh, uh, in this book, uh, in the forward part, uh, I mentioned uh, that there is no such thing like Asian consensus. So, which means uh, uh, Asian development history, Asian countries developed uh, based on more standard ideas of using market and uh, the private sector uh, 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 investment and also the institutions are uh, uh, put forward by the government. So uh, that is a theme of this book. Of course, uh, there can be different ideas to this. And when I visited uh, Beijing uh, last December, I had a chance to visit uh, development uh, uh, 
Institute of uh, Beijing University, which was uh, founded by Mr. Justin Lin, who was uh, uh, the World Bank uh, chief economist uh, previously. And his point is that uh, there is a Asian consensus, or uh, there is a such a word like Beijing consensus, which is more based on the uh, state uh, guidance uh, compared to the market. And uh, I mentioned that, of course, uh, the state is always important in any country, including uh, the United States in 19th century, and uh, uh, of course, Japan after the war, uh, Meiji modernization, and Germany in late 19th century. The state is always uh, important, but uh, is it unique? And uh, uh, he mentioned that uh, the transition uh, was um, smooth, uh, more, I mean, gradual, and uh, it is more practical, and. Uh, there is a uh, uh, going forward and the back, and it is uh, not more uh, as straightforward as Washington consensus to uh, do private sector uh, privatizations and uh, reforms uh, uh, in a very uh, immediate way or a big bang approach. I said that uh, of course countries do should do it uh, gradually in many uh, reforms, otherwise uh, there will there will be more mess uh, instead of. Uh, the, uh, uh, the development of progress. And the Russian case after the collapse of a Soviet system was a more big bang approach and there was a lot of uh, confusions and also the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, reductions of uh, output uh, in those years. So of course that is not a good way to do, to handle these issues, except uh, there is a political maybe background that they don't want to go to the communist system after the collapse of the Soviet system. So they had to rush to do this, but uh, generally speaking, it's better to have a more gradual practical approach as uh, China took. But is it uh, very unique or it's a very natural, uh, uh, I mean, uh, reasonable way of doing things. And he mentioned that, uh, of course, there are differences in means instead of ends. Ends is similar to use the market forces as much as possible private sector is important and the institution by the government is important. So ends are not so different. Goals are not so different, but the approach or means are different. That's what he said. But so there are many ways to explain the Asian development and also countries differences are sometimes even greater than the difference between the Washington consensus or American type development and Asian type development. Countries in Asia are different also. So oh, there are many ways to explain, but uh, it's a very interesting topic to discuss. So that is a, a kind of an introduction to, uh, do, uh, to this book. And the reasons uh, the ADB published this book is, uh, yeah, I'll explain this in, based on this uh, uh, book's production, page two. Page two, please. So this book is, uh, uh, after the ADB's own history book uh, of uh, banking on the future of Asian and Pacific, which was published in 2017 to commemorate the uh, 50th anniversary of uh, ADB. ADB was established in 1966 uh, with the uh, support of uh, Asian countries and uh, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and of course the United States. And at that moment, uh, the People's Republic of China was not a member, but uh, Taipei China was a member, by the way. So uh, uh, 2017, uh, we published uh, uh, 50 years of ADB. But uh, when, then uh, the staff started thinking that it's better to have another book, which is about Asian development history itself. And uh, of course, uh, the idea is that uh, uh, the World Bank published uh, the well-known the East Asian Miracle in 1993, but at that moment uh, it covered uh, Japan and some uh, newly industrialized economies, which is Taipei, China, China Korea, uh, Singapore, and uh, Hong Kong, China, and several Asian countries, but it didn't cover China. And uh, it didn't cover India and the other South Asian countries and Central Asian countries. But since then, they're having a lot of uh, progress in those areas too. And of course, uh, China's uh, um, emergence as a big power is uh, one of uh, the biggest 
topic in early 20th century, uh, 21st century. So this book is compared to the East Asia miracle, with several characters. One is a longer term horizon, as I mentioned, and it covers all Asian development economies. 46 ADB members, developing uh, ADB members. Uh, it doesn't uh, necessarily cover the Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, but from time to time, as necessary, it covers also Japan. And also it reviews new issues such as climate change and population aging and uh, the uh, responses to Asian financial crisis and global financial crisis. And uh, it also covers the impact of global value chains and new technologies and uh, increasing importance and variety of new services. By the way, services are becoming a very important part of uh, the uh, GDP production and employment. I'll touch upon that issue. So my uh, feeling is that at the time of uh, Asian Miracle, the focus was more about uh, the uh, uh, manufacturers uh, uh, sectors, uh, industrial sector, but the uh, service sector is becoming important. And I also asked uh, the staff to include uh, of course, uh, income distribution is important, but gender equality, for instance, uh, that is a separate uh, chapter in this 15 chapters book. And by the way, uh, the third point is uh, this book was uh, produced by diverse team of staff. Uh, so oh, in a sense, uh, there are so many uh, economists who have uh, PhD uh, degrees uh, at the ADB and uh, I thought it is very important to mobilize, to ask those staff to write this paper, a uh, book based on their expertise, including uh, health, uh, education, gender, agriculture, energy, transport, water, and so on. So uh, when we published, uh, started writing this, uh, it, was, it took uh, three years, by the way. Uh, toward the end, uh, last uh, summer, I mean, uh, half a year before the, uh, uh, finalization, I realized that, that there was no chapter regarding energy, transport, and water, and other infrastructure investment, although there was a discussion about investment and saving and the financial sector role to mobilize uh, a saving for investment. But the ADB's strength is uh, to support the infrastructure like uh, uh, highways and railways and uh, uh, energy, I mean, electricity and uh, uh, the urban uh, infrastructure. So why don't we include uh, those elements? And uh, chapter one chapter is about the infrastructure development. And uh, there are so many interesting stories in it. Uh, for instance, uh, the first electricity in uh, Asia was uh, near Toranomon, uh, the center of Tokyo. Uh, and it was uh, for the uh, most uh, uh, signals and it was not for lamp because the lamp was uh, uh, coming later so and when did we uh, have uh, uh, fast uh, uh, hydro energy and it was in Kyoto uh, Keage uh, uh, canal from uh, Biwa Lake to Kyoto so it was uh, in late uh, uh, 90, 19th century maybe 1880s and so in Bombay there was also energy production that kind of Anecdotes, episodes are so interesting. And, uh, and also uh, th there is a such an interesting topic that uh, uh, transport uh, was more focused on the uh, railways in the beginning and uh, like in the British. Uh, and uh, Japan started uh, having uh, so many railways and India also uh, built a lot of railways under the uh, British uh, uh, regime. Uh, there were so many railways, but uh, after the World War II, there was a mortalization. But there is a coming back of uh, railway system because of uh, environmental impact. And also uh, a high speed train was uh, first uh, produced in Japan in 1964, but it is now very common and uh, China with a lot of uh, highways, I mean, high speed trains. So I hope that if uh, you're interested in this book, uh, that kind of uh, episodes about uh, different uh, aspects of uh, development is also very important point. And uh, the uh, uh, next page, please. So uh, the reasons, of course, uh, we wanted to have such a book is uh, Asia had a very remarkable growth uh, 
compared to other developing regions of the world, like uh, Africa or Latin America. And uh, developing Asia's share of global GDP rose from 4% to 24% between 1960 to 2018. And including uh, advanced economies of Asia, it is uh, from 13% to 34%. And in coming years, of course, it will be passing uh, uh, the uh, uh, 50% mark of uh, GDP in coming years if Asia continues to grow. And the uh, developing Asia's per capita GDP grew 15 fold. And uh, uh, also uh, the performance was really good regarding uh, not just economic growth, but uh, a structural transformation from uh, farming sector to industry to services, poverty reductions, absolute poverty was reduced dramatically and improvement in health and education. So I'll touch upon those issues later. So next page, please. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, what is uh, the unique part of Asian consensus? And uh, this book uh, presents the idea that uh, it's not so unique. Uh, Asian policies should, can be explained by the standard economic theories and not so different from uh, Washington consensus, which means uh, like in the next period, uh, implemented import liberalization, opening up of uh, FDI, financial sector deregulation, capital account liberalizations, and so on. Those were done, but it was done more based on meeting uh, certain conditions and gradually, sequential way. And as I mentioned, it's in a sense stupid if uh, countries do this in a big bang way, all of these things, if they do it, it uh, in an instant manner, it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a sensible idea, but uh, Asia did this in a more pragmatic ways. And demographic dividend was in, important in many countries, uh, including in Japan, for instance, and, but uh, uh, the rapid technological progress, globalizations, and uh, uh, generally open trade and investment reg regimes helped countries to grow fast. But uh, uh, effective uh, policies, strong institutions, and government decisiveness was also very important. And also sometimes clear vision for the future by championed by forward-looking leaders like uh, 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 President Park of 1960s Korea's and Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, those leaders, Mahathir in uh, Malaysia, those leaders uh, championed the uh, more, I mean, market-oriented, external-oriented policies, and they had a very clear idea about the future. And of course, uh, there can be some, I mean, disagreement that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it was not by only by them. And also there were some uh, political kind of uh, uh, concentration of power in those countries during that period. But it's obvious that uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, President Park and uh, Mahathir made a uh, really uh, substantial contribution to the design of countries. Next page, please. One of uh, the many uh, very important points uh, I want to, one, not one, but three of uh, important points I want to mention is, yeah, through my career uh, at the Ministry of Finance, I worked for G7 or G20 heads of uh, uh, states uh, meetings or finance ministers and central bank governors meeting. And I also worked for IMF and uh, the uh, uh, embassy in Washington. So I feel uh, that there is a, a, a certain uh, biased ideas or prejudice or a stereotype cliche type uh, ideas about Asia. That is uh, uh, the state intervention and uh, industrial policy and export oriented trade policies. So I wanted to challenge uh, these uh, kind of uh, stereotypes uh, and about uh, state intervention. Uh, Asia's success essentially relied on the market and private sector as an engine for growth. In many countries, economy started to grow faster when policy shifted from state intervention to market or intention. Although government uh, continued to play important uh, role for institutions and also proactive roles. 
and uh, 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 and also these market-oriented policies had the backing of a long traditions in many countries in India, in China, in Japan, in many countries uh, there has been a long tradition of a commerce. So China was in a sense even more commercial people. Uh, 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 during the medieval days compared to the uh, Europe, for instance. And the, in India, there was a very strong commerce and uh, Bangladesh, uh, Bengal also had a very good productions of uh, uh, and silk. So there is a tradition. So uh, it's not just a state intervention. In Japan, for instance, uh, in Edo period and uh, before the major modernization, there were already uh, many merchants who started uh, building uh, canals uh, with a concession from uh, the uh, shogunate, which is like a PPP. And the, in Kyoto, there is a, a canal digging, uh, and it was uh, in 17th century with the uh, commission or uh, approval of a shogunate. And uh, out of uh, the revenue, one third is uh, for tax to uh, the shogunate, one third is for current uh, uh, cost of uh, managing uh, the shipment, uh, including uh, repairment and uh, investment in the ships and so on. And one third is uh, income for the uh, uh, builder or family. But it, it was reinvested in digging other rivers for ship uh, transportation. So this is such a, <laughs> in a sense, uh, innovative uh, PPP action in 17th century, and it is very famous that uh, uh, Osaka had a rice uh, future market uh, in uh, Edo period. So there is a, such a tradition. It's not the coming, uh, emerging from nothing, but uh, it is emerging based on the tradition. And the role of uh, industrial policy is often emphasized. By the way, about uh, the uh, state intervention, it is obvious that in many countries uh, there were state intervention or socialist influence. And also many countries were socialist countries. I mean, China, Vietnam, and Central Asia are all communist and cent uh, socialist countries. And it was based on centrally planned economies and also uh, uh, state ownership of a property and uh, 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 concentration of a power to communist uh, party. But today there are so many socialist countries still, but uh, about central, central control, central planning. They already, in a sense, dismissed the idea of a central planning. Uh, they, they are using market uh, instead of uh, planning. So it, the state intervention was very strong in some countries uh, until 1960s and 70s. India was also influenced by such idea. And India, Indonesia was also influenced by such idea. But over time, uh, the state intervention was uh, being uh, mitigated. Japan and uh, these countries, uh, state uh, in intervention from the beginning was uh, uh, a light, light approach. And the role of target industry uh, uh, is, uh, target industrial policy is related to that issue. And, uh, uh, but uh, the, I think there is a too much emphasis on uh, target industrial policy because some industrial policy worked, but some didn't. And in case of Japan, uh, there was a uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, the uh, uh, targeted policies in 1950s and 1940s, especially just after the war, there was a total shortage of uh, anything uh, starting from foreign exchange saving and steel, coal and uh, uh, others. So they had to uh, focus on those industries as a kind of base for uh, reco reconstructions uh, from uh, de uh, devastations of the war. So it's not uh, uh, the normal uh, kind of case of uh, Japanese economy. So Japan from the Meiji period, uh, of course there was an uh, institution uh, adopted by the government and the uh, government tried to import a lot of system from abroad, Western countries. But uh, the railway was uh, built uh, first by the uh, private sector merchants and capitalists. And uh, many things were developed by private sector because there was no such idea that uh, uh, business was operated by the government. Uh, Japan was uh, more influenced by the British idea or American ideas of capitalist countries. So there was an institution building, but uh, 
even if uh, it was studied as a uh, national uh, kind of uh, uh, business like railway or certain factory, it was uh, divested. It was sold to private sector as soon as possible because as soon as possible because the government didn't have a such idea to operate those things by the government. Uh, uh, I mean, as a government, so it, it the private sector is essentially important. And uh, uh, some industry uh, policy, industrial policy, were effective. And uh, uh, in the case of Japan, the car industry was protected uh, until 1960s. First, uh, import from uh, America was uh, uh, protected, and also uh, direct investment in Japan in car industry was uh, more limited. Although uh, there was a big uh, factory of a Ford before the war. There was a very big factory in Yokohama by the fall. So it was open, but the, during the, uh, I mean, 1930s and 40s, uh, during the war time, of course, uh, uh, Toyota and Nissan started uh, having uh, more domestic cars. And then it was more protected until 1960s, uh, including uh, direct investment competition from uh, uh, FDI, from American uh, automobile companies. I think it was successful because uh, Unless uh, it was protected, the car industry in Japan couldn't uh, compete with the uh, American uh, car makers. But it was uh, successful because uh, it made the car prices lower with the quality, and it uh, provided the opportunity for <coughs> motorization for Asia. But in many sectors, it was not as successful. Uh, there were so many motor bike companies, and the government wanted to, in a sense, uh, uh, Rationalize it, but it was not successful. And uh, there was the idea of uh, more consolidating uh, electricity companies uh, in the past, but it was not very successful. So industrial policy is uh, effective in some cases, and also uh, even in the United States, uh, the GAFA, uh, uh, GAFA technologies, uh, uh, including uh, AI or uh, internet and uh, GPS were first produced by the uh, uh, for military purpose, and so in in that regard, uh, the complex of uh, military technologies and military industries and the military itself for the government plays a very important role. So, in any country, the government plays a certain role, but uh, there is too much emphasis on the uh, targeted industry policy for Asia. Export-oriented trade policy is also mentioned so often. But it's not export-oriented per se, because uh, the, uh, the reason for export orientation, export promotion, is to import more. So it should be uh, called a more outward-oriented uh, policies. And uh, Japan is often mentioned as an example of uh, export-oriented policies. But until 1960s, uh, Japan constantly suffered from uh, uh, constraint of uh, current account deficit. And uh, Japan was on the marge of uh, the uh, uh, going to the IMF to borrow foreign exchange because it was in shortage. Japan had to tighten the uh, macroeconomic policies so that the uh, foreign reserve uh, can be uh, maintained. Uh, otherwise, the uh, import was too big to, and the uh, foreign exchange is coming down and they couldn't uh, intervene in the exchange rate market to keep a fixed exchange rate regime of 360 yen per dollar. So to keep it, of course, uh, uh, countries need to uh, intervene in the exchange rate market and they needed the uh, reserve. But Japan had a constant shortage of uh, foreign exchange reserve. So that's why Japan needed uh, to uh, promote export. So to the contrary, in uh, many Latin American countries, they took uh, import substitution policies. And the idea is uh, unless uh, uh, there is import substitutions, these countries uh, continue to uh, uh, import uh, uh, capital goods machines and uh, manufactured goods more generally from uh, abroad. And uh, terms of trade, uh, prices of manufactured goods continue to go up and agriculture prices are kept low. So they are, in a sense, they will be continued to be repressed by the, uh, uh, the European countries uh, regarding uh, manufacturing uh, imports. 
So they wanted to uh, substitute imports by their domestic production. But uh, ironically, these policies uh, ended up with the shortage of a current uh, uh, foreign exchange reserve. And uh, they had a, a BOP transfer payment crisis in 1980s uh, because uh, uh, they had to import natural resources, capital goods and technologies anyway, but there was no money to uh, buy those things. So import substitution policy because of uh, narrow domestic uh, market and uh, no competition within the market, within domestic market and also with the other countries, uh, it was not really efficient at all. And uh, there were SOEs and uh, plural exchange rate to, uh, to support uh, uh, domestic industry and so on. And it, is, it was full of uh, inefficiency. But at that moment, uh, because of uh, the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, ideas to fight against the uh, uh, colonial approach and also based on the idea of uh, center peripheral, as I mentioned, uh, center countries like uh, Europe uh, will continue to prosper while peripheral were uh, in a sense dis disadvantaged by the uh, uh, unfavorable prices of uh, agricultural products. So we need to promote uh, heavy and chemical industries by the import subsidy, but it was not uh, efficient. And it's uh, in China too. Until 1960s, until Cultural Revolution, China took the policies of import substitute or to do things by themselves, but it was not efficient at all. And uh, so they decided to uh, uh, start uh, opening up and uh, uh, reform. So next uh, page, please. But of course, uh, the Asian countries shouldn't be complacent uh, and there is a such idea that, uh, as I said, uh, by the mid of the uh, 21st century, Asia's uh, output will be more than 50%. So Asia century. But uh, uh, there are many remaining challenges such as uh, poverty, increasing income inequality, large gender gaps and environmental degradation, climate change and so on. And uh, millions people still lack adequate access to health, education, electricity, and safe drinking water. And also uh, continue to, uh, they must continue to make utmost efforts to promote friendship and cooperation in Asia and Vietnam. If the Asia's growth overall, of course there was a Vietnam War and conflict in Cambodia, and uh, there was of course Afghanistan, uh, conflict and there are some uh, conflicts still around. But uh, generally speaking, Asia could enjoy the stability of the region. So we should continue to make utmost efforts to promote uh, the sense of cooperation and friendship among Asian countries. And also it is too early to mention the 21st century as an Asian century because uh, uh, I believe that uh, from 15th century or 16th century, the Western country, European countries uh, have been major uh, kind of hegemon in terms of uh, science, technologies, industries, and also institutions uh, like a capitalistic system and uh, accounting and uh, commercial laws and so on. So, it's too early to mention Asian century, but uh, Asia at least has uh, made uh, very big uh, strides in terms of uh, social and economic development. Next page, please. So this book uh, has uh, 15 chapters. The first uh, chapter is uh, like summary. And the second uh, chapter is the role of markets and the state and the institutions. So to me, Market is so important and the market and private sector activity is always the source of growth and, in, uh, and, and uh, innovations uh, and uh, new uh, ideas, new uh, uh, I mean, uh, products and new methodology and so on. Because people want to uh, I mean, uh, make a profit and it's like uh, Adam Smith's idea. But of course the state is important because the state uh, provides uh, public uh, goods which cannot be supplied by the private sector, like uh, 
railroad, uh, certain road, and uh, uh, and also water system is often by the local authorities, and uh, uh, the uh, of course police and uh, uh, banking system. Uh, of course, banks are private, but uh, uh, regulations of banking system is by the state. So, state plays a very important role, and the institutions by the state. So when I look at, and also this book uh, 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 is uh, looking at the, uh, some cases of uh, state role and market role in different countries. But uh, if uh, I look at the Meiji modernization again, which was started in 1868, of course, uh, import of uh, technology and uh, science or machines and capital goods, railways and so on was very important. But I think uh, it was really, essential to uh, start uh, having uh, university systems uh, to promote science, including literature, for instance, and philosophy, and uh, accounting system, and uh, uh, the uh, joint stock companies, uh, social, I mean, security exchange, and uh, uh, commercial and uh, uh, civil laws, and uh, uh, constitutions, uh, to establish a diet or a parliament. But I think it was also possible because uh, before the major restoration, there was uh, already such ideas like a future market and uh, the accounting by the, uh, by the uh, merchants. So it was not so, uh, uh, I mean, uh, not from uh, the nothing, but uh, it was built on the tradition, but it was really important to was such a systemic ideas of uh, having the uh, diversity to promote uh, science and technologies and literatures and laws and so on. So in any country which uh, is successful in modernization, it's very important to have a role of a state in institutions building. And dynamics of structural transformation, it is about the from farming to uh, uh, industry or manufacturing and then to services. And uh, uh, the development of uh, the countries is, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, equal to the, uh, such a transformation. By the way, can, you, uh, can we look at the page here, eight uh, uh, map? And this is a coverage of uh, this book, which is a uh, membership of ADB up to uh, Georgia uh, in Central Asia and up to Afghanistan. Iran was, is not included because Iran didn't uh, become a member of ADB in 1966, although it was uh, considering it. But uh, because uh, uh, Iran couldn't get the presidency and also the headquarters, which is now in Manila, they decided not, not to join. But anyway, this is uh, the uh, membership of ADB and uh, the uh, countries uh, uh, discussed in this book. The next page, please. Uh, so average growth uh, of uh, Asia was very high and it, uh, in a sense, uh, accelerated up to 2000-2009. And uh, you can see that uh, China's growth was very large, I mean, like 8 to 9 percent. And it came down, but it is still high. I don't know what will be this year's growth, uh, 2 percent or so, but next year will be recovering. And India also accelerated growth over years. And the first East Asia, generally speaking, also had a very stable growth. If it is a 6% growth, it means that in 12 years, it will double. And Japan growth was very high in 1960s, but it came down over years. Uh, okay, so compared to the Latin America or Sub-Sahara Africa, it is obvious that the Asia's growth was very high and compared to OECD or developed countries, it was really high. The next page, please. The next page, please. Yeah, so this is the global share, as I mentioned. So in 1960s, European Union's countries had about 36% of a global GDP and North America, Canada and the US was 31% and developing Asia was a mere 4.1%. Uh, but uh, today developing Asia is 24% and including Japan and Australia, as I mentioned, it will be like a 32 or 33%. Uh, 
and uh, EU share was uh, uh, reduced and uh, North America share was reduced. Although the United States has, is a still very strong economy and uh, is still growing. The next page, please. Yeah, this is a uh, uh, sector share. So you, you can see that the agriculture uh, GDP is uh, becoming smaller from 32% in 1972 to about 9%, 8.5% in 2018 in developing Asia as a whole. And in developed uh, uh, Asia, Australia and Japan, you can see that uh, GDP share of agriculture is so limited, although it is still very important sector uh, uh, for, or, I mean, uh, feeding people. Uh, industries uh, uh, in, is, uh, uh, has uh, now larger shares in Asia, but in many countries, uh, they already started uh, uh, this uh, industrializations or servicizations of uh, the industry. So uh, in Japan, for instance, uh, industries uh, share became lower and in Southeast Asia, it, it, it already started uh, declining. Service sector, uh, on the other hand, has uh, expanded and uh, uh, in uh, developed countries, generally speaking, uh, the service sector's uh, GDP is uh, like uh, 70%. And uh, uh, in case of uh, 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 Asian countries, uh, there is uh, still room for service sector to grow, which will lead uh, uh, GDP growth. So I once uh, talked with the, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Igan of uh, People's Republic, I mean, uh, the uh, People's Bank of China. And uh, 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 he mentioned that uh, there is a lot of service uh, in China, which is not monetized, which is not through the market, uh, the direct uh, dealing between uh, people. But if it is um, coming to the market, uh, it will make the service sector even larger. And one of the examples is if a, a housewife or a house husband, <laughs> whichever, is a cooking a hamburger at home and uh, eat it. It is not recorded as a GDP production, but if uh, uh, she or he goes out for work and buys a, a, a McDonald's hamburger, uh, and if uh, they work for the McDonald's, it will make uh, GDP higher. So if a service uh, is a market, in the market, it will uh, increase the GDP. And that is, uh, the uh, the procedures process of a development the service sector is becoming more and more important in many countries and it means that there is a more choice and even industrial sectors are more service sectors in Toyota for instance uh, people working in the factory is a much smaller number compared to the whole employment of Toyota many people are engaged in marketing and uh, designing and uh, 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 management of the people and so on. So in any countries, uh, when the GDP per capita is increasing, there is a more service sectors and the industry itself is becoming service. And also service sector is uh, now becoming tradable. So business process outsourcing in Philippines and India, for instance, because of the advantage of speaking English, there are so many people working in uh, Philippines or Indonesia who are dealing with the uh, uh, call center for American clients of uh, banks who are to uh, take care of uh, cyber security things or accounting or legal services as a business process outsourcing. Service sector was regarded non-tradable non sectors before, but today because of IT, internet uh, connections, uh, service sector is becoming uh, also tradable and uh, this area is uh, expanding. The next page, please. So the uh, industrial transformation or sector transformation is even more obvious in employment. So in agriculture sector in 1970 to 79, 71% of developing Asia uh, working force was in agriculture sector, but today it is coming down to one third. It is still large compared to the GDP production, but uh, it's a very big change and service sector is now absorbing more. So the next page, please. 
Uh, by the way, can, can we return to the uh, uh, table of contents, uh, page seven? So, uh, page seven, please. So page seven is about, once again the uh, table of contents. So uh, what I uh, explained is the dynamics of structure transformation and in the importance of subsector, and especially subsector is important, including uh, wellness uh, services like uh, the uh, uh, aesthetic or uh, uh, tourism, for instance, and tourism is becoming a very important sector for many countries and in some central uh, uh, Pacific Island countries like uh, Fiji, it is uh, the biggest uh, GDP uh, uh, earner, but it is now hardly hit, hard hit by the corona, uh, corona uh, COVID-19. It's very sad, but I think uh, if uh, people become richer, they want to go abroad and uh, to enjoy tourism even more. So once we have our cars and uh, air conditions and uh, those products, people want to do more tourism or other services. So I think it will continue to grow. By the way, uh, modernizing agriculture and uh, rural development is also a very important part of development. And unless uh, the farming sector has a uh, good uh, productivity people must work for farming, otherwise they cannot feed the whole population. So in a sense, uh, development, economic development starts from agriculture sector. If agriculture sector becomes more productive, uh, the uh, 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 surplus uh, labor can work for industries and services. And uh, also the, uh, there is a, when there is a surplus in farming sector, by having, uh, uh, by promoting industries, they can move to urban industrial places and less people in agriculture sector and their productivity will gain. And also the industry can give uh, better wages for those people who are migrating from farming sector. So oh, that is a kind of vice versa and uh, uh, transformation happens uh, in many, areas and uh, farming is very important as I said unless uh, agriculture sector is productive uh, people cannot work for industries and services and in that regard uh, this section uh, chapter discusses the importance of land reform and especially in Japan and Korea uh, there were very radical uh, uh, very uh, uh, drastic uh, land reform by allocating uh, land to peasants uh, is from taken from uh, uh, the uh, landowners. And of course, in China, it happened. And in a sense, it had uh, two impacts. One is uh, to make the society more inclusive or equal. And also it's a kind of fairness uh, uh, kind of uh, aspect. And another is uh, by providing, allocating lands to the peasants the productivity of agriculture is uh, 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 improved because uh, farmers uh, pay more attention to their own land instead of uh, for landlords uh, land. They try to keep uh, soil uh, rich and uh, uh, to protect from disasters as much as possible. So land reform was very important and green revolutions uh, in 1960s and so on was very important by having uh, new varieties of uh, more harvest uh, for rice and wheat, and also more resilient to uh, some disasters. So variety was important and uh, uh, the fertilizer was important and uh, pesticide was important. And of course, uh, irrigation was important. So green revolutions was very dramatic to raise the uh, income of uh, farmers. Uh, and uh, uh, technological progress as key driver. There was a, such an uh, idea by, <laughs> uh, yeah. by, by, by uh, discussed by the uh, Mr. Paul Krug, uh, uh, Krugman, uh, and he discussed in 1990s that uh, Asian growth uh, was more based on the uh, mobilizations of uh, labor and uh, uh, the capital. But this labor includes uh, already uh, the uh, better education. So, but anyway, 
he uh, discusses that uh, the uh, Asian growth uh, was more based on the uh, mobilization of resources uh, of uh, labor and capital, but not based on the efficiency gains. And it was uh, more like a, a Soviet system because of the mobilization of resources. And in a sense, he predicted the Asian growth is a kind of myth and they will hit the, the wall uh, sooner or later. And then there was a Asian crisis. So some people mentioned that uh, Kruger was right to uh, predict uh, the, uh, the limitations of Asian growth. But I, I, from the beginning, I thought it is total mistake of uh, the discussion by Krugman because uh, mobilizing uh, labor and capital in an efficient way is uh, already quite an achievement which was not uh, uh, clear, uh, very possible in African countries, for instance. And in addition, please go to page 14. If uh, uh, there is a, 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 I mean, a growth based on the uh, uh, capital input, labor input, and human capital. Human capital is uh, one of, uh, by the way, productivity, isn't it? Better education for each people. But anyway, uh, after this mobilization happened, uh, there can be uh, the uh, uh, growth based on total factor productivity gains. Total factor productivity is uh, uh, the contributions uh, to the growth, which cannot be explained by these uh, three other uh, elements, capital input, the labor input, and human capital. Human capital is like education years. So you can see that uh, from this analysis, uh, total factor productivity plays a more important role in uh, the recent years compared to uh, 1970 and 1985. By the way, Krugman's uh, uh, discussion was based on the analysis made by other economists which didn't cover the China, by the way. So it's more about uh, uh, the uh, Nis countries and several others. But anyway, Asia's growth has been more and more dependent on technologies. And uh, China was regarded uh, low wage uh, countries uh, and uh, they took advantage of using it to invite the foreign direct investment to assemble, to produce things. But uh, 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 China's uh, 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 economy is now more based on the uh, higher technologies. Korea was, in a sense, a follower of uh, Japan in many ways, uh, in the uh, like uh, uh, flying geese uh, uh, model. But uh, Korea's uh, Samsung has uh, so many uh, intellectual property rights, and it is now more known company than Sony, for instance. Sony is a Japanese company. And uh, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, in Philippines, there are so many new entrepreneurs and uh, new ideas and uh, new products uh, and new technologies. So I would say Asia's growth is more based on technologies and it will continue to do so. Uh, although there is a difference between countries, especially China is regarded uh, uh, kind of a uh, uh, possibility for technology uh, champion because uh, they have a more kind of concentrated uh, efforts in data and AIs and some research and development. So in, in a sense, more state guided research and development. And because of large population, they can mobilize more researchers for certain products. But, uh, but anyway, China's uh, issue is uh, China has been growing very fast based on the open system and uh, open to foreign direct investment and export and import and took advantage of lower wages. And it is based on the, once again, interactions with other countries. So they sent uh, so many people to abroad for studying uh, to the colleges and so on. And they invited a lot of foreign direct investment. So if uh, such an uh, interaction linked with the developed countries, uh, including uh, US, uh, European countries, Japan, I think it will damage uh, the potential of a growth of China. So whether China is uh, decoupled from uh, uh, the global value chain of uh, the uh, uh, world is a very important point to, to look at the future of uh, China. I hope that uh, 
will keep a kind of global value chains uh, working smoothly and uh, we'll have a cooperative uh, friendly relation between countries for that purpose. Uh, the next, uh, can you come back to the uh, education, health and demographic change? So uh, page, page seven. So by the way, this book uh, looks at uh, different uh, elements of growth, uh, uh, growth accounting. So first is uh, uh, labor, uh, what I mean, first is uh, total factor productivities or productivity technologies, and then labor element, which is education, health, and demographic change. And then capital part, which is investment saving, how to mobilize saving for productive investment, and what is the role of finance. And the education was uh, played a very important dramatic increase of uh, the uh, 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 school years. And also the health uh, was improved a lot. And uh, the demographic uh, dividend uh, also uh, helped uh, the growth. Uh, demographic uh, uh, dividend is uh, the share of the working age population is uh, increased uh, 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 within the uh, population and population itself grows. So the GDP grew because of uh, more working age populations in that population and population itself expanded. And in 1960s, Japan, there was a very high contributions of uh, production I mean, uh, the uh, demographic uh, dividend, although uh, Japan and many uh, Asian countries now have uh, demographic onus or tax because of a lower share of uh, uh, working age population. But the education uh, uh, played a very important role. And uh, can you go to the page uh, 12.1? Uh, I mean, uh, page 17. And uh, this is uh, uh, many years of a uh, completed uh, female and male schooling. And if uh, you look at, uh, uh, for instance, uh, 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 Korea, uh, Korea is uh, a Republic of Korea, the second line from the bottom. And uh, in 1960, uh, the uh, uh, men uh, schooling is 7.3 and the women's were 4.2, but today, it is 14.5 and 14.9. Uh, the uh, girls are educated long. And uh, 15 years, if it is six plus three plus three plus four, it is 16 years. So from uh, prim uh, primary school to university, it is 16 years in many countries. But the China is already about 15 years, which means almost universal tertiary education. So schooling years is longer. The next page, please. So this uh, is even more dramatic in some, uh, uh, I mean, uh, South Asian countries. If you look at Bangladesh, women get the uh, average of 0 0.2 years of education in 1960, but it is now receiving 8.6 years of education, longer than boys. Now, why does it happen? Of course, uh, living standards were improved and there was more room for sending uh, kids to schools, but also it became clear that the investing in education, investing in female education is, uh, is uh, worth it because uh, Bangladesh has a very uh, prospering uh, uh, textile sector or garment sector. And uh, to, for girls to go to those factories, they need the uh, basic education of mathematics and uh, because language and so on. So, it is worth investing in education, especially women's education. So it is a kind of dramatic uh, uh, change of uh, uh, education. And uh, also health uh, was uh, improved a lot and uh, people live uh, much longer and uh, 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 there was a uh, life expectancy was uh, very uh, uh, short. Uh, and, but it is uh, uh, much longer now. And why is that? And uh, health uh, was improved uh, uh, 
uh, across countries uh, because of uh, 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 the service for delivery of a birth and uh, uh, fatality of uh, women uh, during the birth was uh, totally improved. And of course, uh, health services, hospitals are more prevalent and uh, more coverage of uh, health insurance. And also vaccine and medicine uh, were developed. And uh, these are very important, people understand it. But the most important element of uh, the uh, longer uh, life expectancy is because of uh, more, I mean, better quality water and sanitation. So uh, many uh, uh, kids uh, uh, died, infant died because of diarrhea in the past, but today because of uh, a better living standard and sanitation and water, uh, the uh, 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 children's uh, 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 fatality rate, more, 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 mortality uh, was dramatically reduced. So education and health uh, condition improved uh, a lot in these uh, uh, several decades. So there is a, uh, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, and also uh, immunization and uh, uh, also played an important role. Uh, tuberculosis was uh, was uh, uh, to, uh, almost eliminated in many countries. Although there is a new kind of uh, tuberculosis, which is uh, against uh, resilient to the uh, antibiotics. Anyway, uh, th there is a, such a discussion in this book. Can you come back to the event uh, again? So. Yeah, I must uh, finish uh, my speak, uh, speaking to, I already spoke too much, but the investment uh, was also very important and the investment uh, was, uh, uh, was uh, supported by high savings. In the beginning, it was not very high because uh, the people were very poor and there is less room for savings, but over years, Asia had a very high saving rate and the household saving rate was uh, very uh, high and because uh, Partly because uh, the growth was uh, 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 very rapid, so uh, like uh, uh, the uh, uh, permanent income theory, uh, people, unless they know that uh, this income increases permanent, they wouldn't consume as much. And also, uh, they are late to consume compared to the income. And also, uh, because of uh, underdeveloped uh, social security system, the health system, people had to save. But also, coastal saving system and policies to promote saving in many countries helped. And in Asia, uh, fin financial sector was often dominated by the banks. And there is a discussion that capital market plays a more important role in many countries. But banks was also very, imp well, very important because uh, they can mobilize a small saving of depositors to SME finance. Uh, the uh, bond issues is possible for big corporation, but for supporting SME, sometimes uh, uh, the banks uh, play very important. The infrastructure development, I already mentioned there was a very huge development in progress in transport, energy, and urban facilities. And uh, trade and foreign direct investment played very important role. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, as I said, uh, the uh, outward uh, uh, oriented policy was important and uh, special economic zone played a role. Passing macroeconomic policies, uh, stability, over time, uh, countries uh, take a more stable, uh, prudent macroeconomic policies, especially after Asian financial crisis of 1990s. And the poverty reduction, the income distribution, poverty reduction, was uh, achieved a lot because of more I mean, investment and uh, more foreign direct investment from abroad and so on. But the income distributions in 1960s and to up to 1980, in some countries like East Asia, there was a uh, 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 I mean, uh, decreasing uh, Gini coefficient, but after that, uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, increased inequality because of globalizations and technologies. S more skilled people get more income, while 
uh, ordinary workers' uh, gain was more limited. And also, uh, the landowners and the traditional business, uh, because of a partnership with the foreign direct investment, they become even richer. And the skilled workers, uh, graduate the school graduates or university graduates, those uh, people's uh, uh, increase of income is greater than others. So even if uh, people become richer, all people become richer in developing countries at least, uh, the gap is now wider. Gender is uh, being improved, although there is a lot of, uh, I mean, room for further improvement in terms of uh, wages and uh, voices in the political areas and so on. Uh, environmental sustainability and climate change is an uh, important issue, and it's a remaining challenge. And uh, in Asian uh, development, of course, uh, saving, domestic aid saving was important, but also the bilateral and multilateral development finance, like uh, uh, ODA loan from Japan in 1970s and 80s uh, supported China, Korea, Southeast Asian countries a lot. Uh, when there was a shortage of uh, uh, external finance in these countries. And also the World Bank, ADB, and these uh, systems also have supported the uh, finance of uh, important infrastructure. And over time, uh, the focus moved toward uh, more for social sectors such as education and uh, health. And uh, regional cooperation, the uh, integration in Asia, regional cooperation through ASEAN, for instance, was very important uh, system. And uh, there were so many attempts of regional cooperation, which promoted good, good policies as well as trade regulations and harmonization standards. I couldn't cover all these things in, uh, uh, I mean, deep enough way, but I mentioned uh, the most important element of uh, these things. So now we have uh, still 20 minutes uh, uh, for Q&A. So I really welcome any question, whatever it is. Thank you very much.